Can we find a useful application for neutrinos? These almost weightless, uncharged particles considered some of the most mysterious objects in all of particle physics. We discussed what makes neutrinos so mysterious in one of our previous videos. And today, leading scientists are striving to solve these mysteries. In many countries, massive resources are being spent to build impressive experimental facilities for neutrino research. And as is often the case, one might wonder, what's the point of all this? And can neutrino research lead to technologies that will improve our lives, making them better, more comfortable, safer, and cheaper? In simpler terms, is it even theoretically possible to make neutrinos useful? This is the question we will attempt to explore in today's video. Let's start by acknowledging that expecting direct benefits from fundamental research right here and now is generally not very reasonable. The point of fundamental research is to push beyond the boundaries of our knowledge about the world, which means, by definition, we cannot know what we'll discover or what use it might have. Fundamental physics is like trying to find keys to a locked room whose contents are entirely unknown to us. Inside, there could be piles of treasure or heaps of useless junk. However, even the useless junk might eventually turn into treasure. When Henri Becquerel discovered radioactivity in the late 19th century, he likely could not have imagined that half a century later, this discovery would lead to nuclear power plants, atomic bombs, and much more. The same is true for neutrinos. We simply cannot predict what we will uncover in the process of studying them, and even the process itself may yield unexpected results. But in this specific case, we already have an idea of how neutrinos might be made useful once we get to know them better and learn to work with them. In fact, neutrinos are already useful right now because they are a valuable tool for scientists to study the world around us. Due to their small mass and lack of electric charge, neutrinos interact very weakly with matter, giving them enormous penetrating power. For example, the mean free path of a neutrino in water is about 100 light years. This means that neutrino streams can pass through even large, massive objects like stars or planets almost without loss, carrying information about objects that would otherwise be completely inaccessible to our observation. One such object, from which we obtain almost all of our information by analyzing neutrino streams, is the core of our sun, a hidden thermonuclear furnace where the reactions that produce sunlight and heat take place. The core of the sun is shielded from our direct observation by hundreds of thousands of kilometers of plasma compressed to monstrous densities in the sun's outer layers. We would have almost no way of learning anything about the processes occurring there if it weren't for the significant number of neutrinos produced in these nuclear reactions, which shoot out in all directions, including toward Earth, where we can detect and study them. Although our current ability to detect neutrinos is unfortunately limited, we capture, at best, one neutrino out of trillions. This has been enough for us to learn about the processes inside the solar core, such as identifying the exact types of nuclear reactions taking place and their intensity. By improving our neutrino detection methods, we could gather even more information about the solar core, an object whose processes literally determine our existence. Another object hidden from direct observation, which we can study using the neutrino streams it emits, is the Earth's interior, which contains, among other things, many beta radioactive isotopes that emit neutrinos as they decay. By analyzing neutrino streams, we can determine which beta radioactive isotopes are present in the Earth's interior, allowing us to more accurately understand the structure and chemical composition of the Earth's mantle and core. Astronomers and astrophysicists see neutrinos as a fundamentally new way to study processes in distant parts of the universe, such as supernova explosions in other galaxies. We have a separate video on our channel dedicated to the phenomenon of supernovae, where we explored this in detail. For now, it's important to note that the gravitational collapse of a star leads to a process called neutronization. The absorption of electrons by protons in the star's atomic nuclei, transforming them into neutrons and emitting large numbers of neutrinos. It turns out that more than 90% of the enormous energy released during a supernova explosion is carried away by neutrinos, 
with less than 10% remaining as electromagnetic radiation. This means that supernova explosions when observed via neutrino streams appear tens of times brighter than when observed through traditional electromagnetic radiation, including visible light. Studying neutrino streams allows us to detect supernova explosions located further away and even those that are hidden from us in the optical range by the body of our galaxy, the Milky Way, since for neutrinos, this is no obstacle at all. Today, impressive facilities are being built to detect cosmic neutrinos for scientific purposes, such as the Baikal Deep Underwater Neutrino Telescope or the Ice Cube Array in the ice of the South Pole. We will discuss how these work in more detail in an upcoming neutrino-themed video, where we'll delve deeper into the physics behind various neutrino detectors. The information we've outlined above alone justifies the significant resources being invested in neutrino research and detection technology. However, neutrinos may have even more practical applications in the future. Since neutrinos can pass through almost anything without much hindrance, the idea of using them for communication naturally arises. A neutrino transmitter, using neutrino streams as a signal source, could easily send signals to the opposite side of the Earth without needing long telecommunications cables or satellites. Such a communication system could theoretically be used to contact submarines or spacecraft on the far side of the moon or other planets. While this technology may not seem necessary right now, in the future, it could become highly relevant, at which point more compact and affordable detectors will be crucial. However, the problem isn't just with the detectors. For neutrino communication to work effectively, we need to create well-focused neutrino beams with very specific characteristics. Fortunately, we already know how to do this, although the methods are quite costly and complex. The most common method of generating neutrino beams is by producing muon neutrinos as a byproduct of bombarding targets made of materials like graphite with protons that have been accelerated to near light speeds in charged particle accelerators. When such protons hit the target, their kinetic energy condenses into various particles, among which we are particularly interested in positively and negatively charged kaons and pions, or as they are sometimes still called, pi mesons and k mesons. These particles carry a charge, and we can manipulate them using electromagnetic fields. Depending on the task at hand, the field is used to concentrate a beam of, say, positive pi and k mesons while dispersing a beam of negative ones, or vice versa. After a short time, on the order of several hundred millionths of a second, these particles decay into a muon and a muon antineutrino in the case of negative k and pi mesons and into an antimuon and a muon neutrino in the case of positive mesons. It turns out that if the k and pi mesons are moving extremely fast, the resulting neutrinos and muons will also move in roughly the same direction as the particles that created them. The higher their speed, the more concentrated the beam will be. The next step is to remove the muons, which is done by passing the particle beam through some solid material. However, some scientists argue that we shouldn't get rid of the muons at all. In fact, muons are the real treasure here, as they can be used to create neutrino beams even more efficiently. Indeed, muons also decay after about two millionths of a second, and the decay products are a familiar electron and two neutrinos. Specifically, a muon neutrino and an electron antineutrino. Muons have a longer lifetime than Ki A and Pi mesons, making them somewhat easier to work with. In particular, they can be placed into another accelerator where they can be further accelerated by an electromagnetic field to near light speeds, producing highly concentrated beams of neutrinos with very high kinetic energy. Muon accelerators required for this task are still being designed, but the initial method of generating neutrino beams using proton accelerators is already being actively used, including for experiments in neutrino communication. For instance, in 2012, researchers at Fermilab in the U.S. used neutrino communication to transmit a short message through 240 meters of solid rock. The receiver was the Minerva detector, a five-meter-long tank filled with sensitive equipment weighing a total of 170 tons. However, despite its impressive size, Minerva's sensitivity still leaves much to be desired. It took scientists more than two hours to decode the neutrino message which consisted of just one word, neutrino. 
In short, neutrino detectors still have a long way to go before we can chat via a neutrino phone or upload pictures to a neutrino internet. Powerful neutrino beams could also have intrinsic value as weapons, or rather as anti-weapons. Extremely powerful neutrino emitters could theoretically be used for the remote destruction of nuclear and thermonuclear warheads. Here's the idea. The core of a nuclear bomb consists of materials like uranium or plutonium capable of sustaining a chain reaction of nuclear fission. If a nucleus is given a certain amount of energy, for example, by striking it with a neutron, it will split into two fragments, releasing significant energy and several more neutrons. Each of these neutrons can then initiate the fission of other nuclei, releasing even more neutrons, causing an avalanche-like reaction in which a large number of nuclei are split in a short period, releasing a great deal of energy, what we call an explosion. Nuclear bombs are designed to initiate the chain reaction at a desired moment. However, neutrino beams could trigger this reaction prematurely against the bomb maker's intentions. Yes, neutrinos interact with matter very weakly, but they do interact occasionally, otherwise we wouldn't be able to detect them. In particular, a neutrino can, with a small probability, collide with an atomic nucleus, and if it has enough kinetic energy, it can break the nucleus apart, releasing some of its neutrons. These neutrons, in turn, may be absorbed by nearby atoms, initiating their fission. In other words, triggering the chain reaction. As I mentioned earlier, nuclear bombs are designed so that the chain reaction can't sustain itself under normal conditions. So such initiation will die down over time. Nevertheless, each interaction between a neutrino and a fissile nucleus will burn out some atoms of uranium or plutonium, and if the neutrino beam is dense enough and bathes the nuclear warhead for long enough, a significant portion of the fissile material could be burned out. Directing such neutrino beams at an enemy nation's nuclear arsenals could enforce a form of nuclear disarmament. Defending against this type of attack would be practically impossible, as nothing can effectively block a neutrino beam. Of course, this is all just theoretical. Neutrinos interact so weakly with matter that to accomplish this, we would need an extremely dense neutrino beam, requiring us to accelerate an enormous number of muons to extremely high energies, which, as I mentioned earlier, first requires producing these muons using another accelerator. It's been calculated that with current technology, creating a neutrino gun would require a muon accelerator with a radius of about 500 kilometers. For comparison, the Large Hadron Collider has a radius of about 14 kilometers. Additionally, a nuclear bomb burner cannot simply be stationary. We would need to be able to adjust its orientation to target enemy nuclear arsenals, which is currently impossible for such cyclopean structures. So we shouldn't expect to see nuclear bomb burners in the world's arsenals anytime soon. To create a neutrino gun, we would need fundamentally new technologies for producing neutrino beams. However, in principle, yes, it is possible. A different matter entirely is the so-called neutrino energy concept, which has been making waves recently. The idea is to create devices that would capture and accumulate the kinetic energy of the existing natural neutrino streams, something like solar panels, but working not with photons of electromagnetic radiation, but with neutrinos. A few years ago, there was widespread news online that a German company, Neutrino Energy Group, had developed a device called the Neutrino Power Cube, supposedly capable of generating five to six kilowatts of power by capturing neutrino streams with a weight of 50 kilograms and dimensions of 80 by 60 by 40 centimeters. It sounds exciting, but to anyone with even a basic understanding of physics, it was immediately clear that this was a hoax an attempt to lure investments in revolutionary technology from impressionable laypeople. Even setting aside this specific device, the very concept of neutrino energy seems dubious, even if we had the most advanced technologies for capturing neutrinos and utilizing their energy. The primary source of neutrinos we deal with on Earth is the thermonuclear reactions occurring in the core of our sun. It turns out that less than 3% of the energy released in these reactions is carried away by neutrinos. In other words, the electromagnetic radiation emitted by the sun carries about 33 times more energy than neutrino streams. 
As such, the concept of utilizing neutrino energy doesn't make much sense. It's far better to focus on harvesting energy from the sun's electromagnetic radiation, something we are already quite good at, certainly much better than catching neutrinos. Modern solar panels can convert about 20% of the electromagnetic radiation from the sun into electricity, whereas current neutrino detectors capture far less than one trillionth of the neutrino stream. And even if, in theory, we could someday convert 100% of the kinetic energy of solar neutrinos into electricity, which I highly doubt is even possible, the energy output per unit area of such neutrino batteries would still be tens of times lower than that of modern solar panels. So even such a wildly futuristic technology, far beyond our current knowledge, would be practically useless for energy generation, although it would undoubtedly revolutionize many other fields including neutrino communication. In conclusion, we can certainly make neutrinos useful, and it's definitely worth working in this direction, especially since our neutrino technologies are still in their infancy. In our next video, we'll discuss what we've already achieved in this field, particularly the neutrino detection technologies in use today and those planned for the near future. And that's all for today, dear friends. All the best, and see you in our upcoming videos.